It's the Mike Francesa Podcast on the Bet Rivers Network. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to the Mike Francesa Podcast. As we uh, look ahead to uh, Championship Sunday, still a couple of days away, and uh, unfortunately to the end of the football season, just three big games left, two on Sunday, and then, of course, a Super Bowl to be played in Vegas on February 11th. Brought to you, as always, by the good folks at Bet Rivers. Download the Bet Rivers app for all of your wagering needs as you uh, finish up this NFL season, as you look forward to the Super Bowl and everything else. Uh, check it out for all of your uh, wagering needs as you get ready for March Madness and everything else. Go to the Bet Rivers app, download it, and away you go. BetRivers.com. Now, a couple things before we touch on the uh, championship games this weekend. Hall of Fame announcements just came out. And it just, to me, really, today my thought was this. The Baseball Hall of Fame was the hall of all halls of fame. It was the diamond in all halls of fame. There was no hall of fame as big or as important to its members, or as influential as the Baseball Hall of Fame. It has always maintained that. But you know what? It has been completely devalued now. And baseball can blame itself. It can blame its hierarchy in the days when steroid use was rampant, and they looked the other way. Baseball, and blame the owners and the players for almost destroying the sport when they shut it down. And obviously everyone knows the great home run chase between Maguire and Sosa brought fans back and brought fans back in a forgiving way to the game. And baseball knew the dirty little secrets that were going on in those days and looked the other way. The commissioner's office looked the other way. The owners looked the other way. And yes, media and fans looked the other way and players looked the other way. We all know that. But what they've been left with now are the remnants of that. And let's be honest, there's no way, even for the most ardent baseball loyalist, to in any way look at the Hall of Fame in the same way now. Because let's be honest, you have had a generation of baseball players and many of the greatest players of that generation, of that last generation, who are now retired now for years. Some of them retired already for a decade. Some of them retired now for almost two decades. But they, the biggest names in that era and the biggest names among them in the history of the game, and they are not in the Hall of Fame. So how do you take that chunk of baseball history how do you take those baseball immortals who on the field earned immortality but behind the scenes have been cast aside because they cheated? I'm not defending the cheaters in any way. We know how rampant steroid abuse was, and, and you will talk to baseball people, and I talk to players and so does everybody else who will tell you that there are already people in the Hall of Fame who use steroids. So they haven't had a perfect system. And they still don't know how to justify that part of history that they've just ignored. They've turned their back on it. And they've turned their back on some of the greatest players in the history of the sport. I'm not here to defend them or get them into the Hall of Fame. I don't care if they ever get in the Hall of Fame. But let's not treat the Hall of Fame in the same way, when they have completely just ignored a generation of baseball. The Hall of Fame is where baseball tells its timeless story of how the game evolved, of all the things. First, it was a white sport. Then, obviously, they broke the racial barrier and let all the great athletes into the game. And that gave us a generation or two of great black players. And now from around the world, they come to play baseball. And we have gifted players and baseball has players from all over the globe who speak multiple languages. Fine. That's a good thing. 
But the bottom line is baseball doesn't still have an answer on how to deal with the generation that they have just drawn the curtains on and left their biggest stars. So if you go try to tell the story of baseball in the past 25 years, you can't tell it from the Hall of Fame because a lot of the guys aren't there. A lot of the most dominant players aren't there. Clearly the best player or maybe even the best three players of that generation are not there. So how does the Hall of Fame in any way be viewed in the same light when there is now a hole in the history of the sport? And baseball has not in any way come to grips with this. They've let those guys on the ballots because they can't keep them off. They haven't been voted in or close to voted in. And they just pass into oblivion and everyone leaves them alone. But you hear the whispers all the time that guys are ready in the hall. Or steroid users. There are guys who are in the hall who are on steroid lists if you look as they're presented. If you look at steroid users, you will look down the list and there will be guys who are in the Hall of Fame who they call steroid users or abusers. And baseball doesn't have any way to rectify this and doesn't have any way to explain this away. Because they didn't catch them, because they looked the other way, because they were better cheaters. And as I've stated, I'm not an advocate for the guys who aren't in. I don't care if they don't get in. But don't try to tell the history of the sport anymore from the Hall of Fame. You can't do it. That timeline has been completely broken. And the way people genuflect to the Hall of Fame is utter nonsense because it no longer tells the story of the game. Because there is a whole generation that has been left out. And until that is rectified, the Hall of Fame can't be the same Hall of Fame. And you're looking at guys who just got into the Hall of Fame. And somebody said to me, man, think of all the better players who are on the outside looking in. They are. And they've been there for a long time looking in. And they will continue to be there because baseball doesn't know how to deal with it. And baseball didn't deal with it. And the commissioner didn't deal with it until Congress embarrassed the heck out of them. And then they said, we are no longer going to do this. Now we're going to try and clean up our sport way, way after the horses were out of the barn. They needed those players to help fix what they ruined at the negotiating table. They use those players to bring the fans back. And then they cast them aside years later. Did they use Sosa and Maguire? Absolutely. Does baseball owe something to Sosa and Maguire? Well, as far as them bringing the sport back, they sure do. Did people revel in what Bonds did or what A-Rod did? Yes. Did they cheat? Yes. How many others did who didn't get caught? That's baseball's little dirty secret. And there's no player who won't tell you that there are multiple, multiple players who didn't get caught and countless others who who were cheating alongside them. So they don't have a system here that even works in detecting and somehow getting back to where they need to be. They've just let this hole linger. And they're going to pass over that generation and say, oh, we now have taken taken care of the problem. But how do you explain it when you can Google a steroid abuser or baseball user list and you have Hall of Famers right there on that list? While others are getting 30% of the vote. It's a big problem for baseball, and it completely diminishes and devalues the Hall of Fame to a point where 
I don't care who gets it. Goes for the player who gets in. As an example, Joe Mauer. I like uh, uh, Joe Mauer was a classy, wonderful baseball player. He did everything the right way. He was a, a really wonderful baseball player to watch. He epitomized everything that is good about baseball. And he got over the barrier and got into the Hall of Fame. Good for him. I'm happy for him. I'm happy for any of the guys because the Hall of Fame means a lot. It means it's, in your profession, it's the pinnacle. There's, not, there's none of us who have been fortunate enough to ever get into a Hall of Fame who aren't incredibly proud the day they get that plaque or that trophy or that award that signifies that you will be remembered as one of the best in the chosen profession. It's special. But baseball's got a problem, and they still have no idea how to fix it. You know, I don't, a couple of random things before I get to the NFL. I don't care who coaches the Bucks. And I'm not really going to investigate why they fired their coach despite their record. I haven't been around the Milwaukee Bucks every day, but I'll tell you this. No matter who takes that job, whether it's Doc Rivers or anybody else, and Doc has a way of finding his way into these jobs, as we know, but they, that is a championship roster. Case closed. I don't care who's coaching that team. That is a championship roster. Big game at the Garden tonight, St. John's, Villanova. I don't see either team being in danger of not making the NCAA tournament. I think Nova, after not making it last year, it would be devastating if they didn't make it this year. But remember, they have all those good wins in the early season when they won their tournament and swept three really good teams. They have some quality wins. St. John's is going to make the NCAA tournament. Right now, if you look at the guys who seed that stuff every day of the year, okay, now the seeding starts to take form a little bit. They have St. John's as like a nine seed and Villanova like as a seven seed, whatever. But Villanova's three, four and three in the conference. St. John's is four and four in the conference and has lost three games in a row. This is a big game. Big game tonight at the Garden for these two teams. One of them comes out of this game reeling a little bit and has to be careful not to let this thing fall apart in a league where it is rough to win anywhere in the Big East. The Big East is brutal. I mean, you can get beat anywhere almost any night with the exception of Georgetown and DePaul which just fired its coach. I mean, you're going to beat Georgetown wherever you play him. You're going to beat DePaul easy wherever you play him. DePaul's 3-15 and and hasn't won a Big East game. Georgetown's 1-1. But other than that, when you look down the league from the bottom up and you have to go play Providence and Butler and Xavier, I mean, those teams are tough, not to mention Connecticut, Seton Hall, Creighton, Marquette. I mean, this league is brutal. Connecticut leads the way at 7-1, and one, and they're the number one team in the country. Remember, St. John's plays them at the Garden on February 3rd, high noon. But this game's a big game. Nova's been up and down. Moore's been in and out of the lineup. They've been up and down. And St. John's got off to a really fast start. Patino missed the game at Seton Hall. They played miserably. They lost a tough game at Creighton. Lost a tough game to Marquette. All tough games in this league. So many games down to the wire in this league. Like I said, I don't think either team is in danger right now of falling out of making the NCAA tournament, but you fall to the bottom of this league. 
and you're going to have to play well in the tournament, in the Big East tournament, to get a bid. This league's going to get a whole lot of bids. It deserves a whole lot of bids, but it's not going to get the whole league in. And the teams that are down the list at 9 and 10, you know what? Those teams have resumes that are good. They have good wins. They can still make it. I mean, Providence lost the key guy, but they, you know what? They're a tough team. So this is a big game tonight. Very big game. And a big game for St. John's. Now, we're a couple of days away from championship Sunday. Kansas City and Baltimore. Baltimore opened as a three-and-a-half point favorite. They're still a a three-and-a-half point favorite. Detroit at San Francisco, nine is opened as a seven-point favorite, and that's a hard number to come off, and nothing's happened. There's still seven-point favorites. The Kansas City-Baltimore game is about as classic a game as you could ever have in the playoffs. Not that you didn't have one last week in Buffalo. You did. You knew those two would play a great game, and they played their typical game. But this game is a... Terrific matchup. Baltimore, which came out in the second half, made the adjustments in the passing game, got rid of the ball quickly, started pounding the ball with their running game, and their offensive line took over the game and pounded the heck out of the Texans both ways. Beat them with their defense, beat them with their offensive line, ran the ball down their throat, ran it for over 200 yards, did the things you would think the Ravens can do. Their quarterback chipped in, he ran a couple in, he threw a couple in, and he got the pressure off him where he hadn't been able to win in the playoffs. Because he's playing against a quarterback this week who does nothing but win in the playoffs and does nothing to win all the time and is as dangerous as an underdog as any quarterback has ever been. Mahomes was terrific in Buffalo. Made no mistakes. As a matter of fact, quite interestingly, the four winning quarterbacks last week in the divisional playoffs, none of them threw an interception. As a matter of fact, among the four winning teams, there was only one Turnover. Kansas City had lost the fumble. That was it. One turnover. So it shows you how important it is in the playoffs to take care of the ball and not have special teams malfunctions. Don't give up that 70-yard punt return. Don't give up that huge kickoff return. And you got to make clutch kicks. Now, Kansas City game, those two kickers, they are as good in the playoffs as anybody could ever be, both of them. You're not going to get the same level in the Detroit-San Francisco game, but you're going to get it in the Kansas City game. That game, to me, is what you would call the classic championship game. These two teams are just so good. They're just terrific teams. Kansas City played so well. In Buffalo, their offensive line did a terrific job. They ran the ball well. Their kids on defense, Chris Jones always leads the way, but their kids on defense stepped up and played terrifically. They had some kids play some, I mean, superb football in that game on defense. Baltimore, with its offensive line, and the game they got out of Clowney, really unexpected for him to be as good as he was in that game. You know, he might get a sack here and there these days, but he played really well in that game. And they got solid play on the defensive line, and they got solid play throughout their lineup, and their offensive line did a terrific job. And I think Dalvin Cook will become a bigger part of that offense as the weeks go on and could prove to be a big key at spots. They gave him a little work the other day. He got, he, he got his feet wet. I think he'll be a bigger factor. So these teams, when you look at them, you got to beat these teams. They're not going to beat themselves. Baltimore's a legitimately good team this year, which is as good on both sides of the ball as anybody is in the sport. And Kansas City, hey, We have watched them now year after year after year. They are going to play their game in this spot. They might lose. 
The one time they looked bad in the playoffs was when their def- when their offensive line was a sh- was just shattered, and it showed. And Mahomes was on the run the whole game, but that's not the case this year. Their offensive line is doing a terrific job. Humphrey, they're getting really good play out of other guys on that line. They are surprisingly good on defense, despite how they've turned over that roster and gotten it from young players who have just stepped up everywhere throughout that lineup and done a terrific job. And Mahomes is going to play his game. You know that. He's going to be hard to beat. That's a classic game. The second game is even a little tighter than you would think. Normally, I wouldn't think Detroit would have that much chance of winning with the Niners. Now, number one, you want Purdy to get it, if you're a Niner fan, to not have a wet, to not have rain, because he can't throw a wet ball. And as soon as the rain stopped, you saw how much better he threw the ball. Some guys just can't throw. Troy Aikman couldn't throw a wet ball. Purdy can't throw a wet ball. Debo's hurt. I would say right now he's probably not going to play. They're not the same team when he doesn't play. That's a big loss for them. And you have to, and I guarantee you this is all San Francisco's thinking about this week, is, hey, we better realize that we have to come to do battle with that Detroit offensive line because that Detroit offensive line wasn't good in a game against Tampa. It was sensational. Sewell was as good from his right tackle spot as anybody was in the playoffs last week. He had a sensational game. Decker at the other tackle did a terrific job. Their center played hurt, and he's a talented player. They have a – I mean, listen, everyone said Philly had the best offensive line. They did. But right now, the Lion line is playing about as well as you can expect an offensive line to play, and they got guys behind it, led by Gibbs, who is a major, major force to deal with because he can turn any play into a touchdown. We all know – Their quarterback doesn't play as well outside as he does inside. Hey, he's got to play his game. But that offensive line and their strength in their running game, they have to run the ball to beat San Francisco. There's no question about it. If they can't run the ball really well, they're not going to beat San Francisco. Because their secondary is not going to stand up to the Niners, even without Debo. And if Debo were there, it would be a whole lot different. Now, I don't think he's playing, but we'll wait till later in the week to touch on that. Because they said it wasn't broken out of shoulder, so now there's at least a chance – He hasn't been ruled out yet, but I doubt he will play. They got some big play from guys on their defense. And you know they're going to step up and play a good game. I mean, that's who San Francisco is. But this Detroit team, which has now had such a wonderful season, gave their fans such a thrill. But they, listen, we all know how much the Lions have just thought and dreamed for years about finally getting to a Super Bowl. They've never been to a Super Bowl. Now they're one step away. And they will need that offensive line and that running game to step up and play that well again for them to have a chance. But it was really good. Really good the other day. And when you get that kind of offensive line, it makes a big difference. When you see teams win in the playoffs, you look and see they didn't turn the ball over. That's number one. But then a lot of times you notice that winning team got a very good performance from that offensive line. And right now, Kansas City's offensive line is playing really well. The Ravens' offensive line is playing really well, and the Lions' offensive line is playing unbelievably. So we have two very interesting games, but we have first a classic heavyweight matchup, and we knew it 
the winner of the Buffalo game was going to have a chance to win in Baltimore. The winner in Baltimore this week is going to have a great chance to win the Super Bowl. I mean, nobody would be surprised if Kansas City won it all. Nobody would be surprised if Baltimore won it all. Nobody would be surprised if San Francisco won it all. Yes, there'd be a lot of surprise if Detroit won it all this year. Winning in San Francisco won't be easy by any stretch. We will have the Football Friday podcast, as always, on this Championship Sunday. It's really, let's be honest, the last one because Super Bowl is so different. And by the time you get to Friday of Super Bowl week, you've already heard more than about the game. You want to get away from everything for a couple of days before they play the game because you're so sick of the hype. The NFL needs two weeks logistically to get everything done to play that game. That's how big the event is. But from a football standpoint and a fan standpoint, it would be so much better if it was played the next week. I understand why it's not, and I understand the logistics of why it's not. I've been to uh, plenty of Super Bowls, and I've been to, uh, I understand the premise of it, of how rushed things are in one week. And it's very hard on the teams, too, because there's so many extra things you have to take care of that you don't even think about. Until you've been around a team when they're traveling to a Super Bowl and understand what goes into it, getting your operations up that week in the Super Bowl city. That means getting your offices up and getting all your research up and getting all your machines up and your secretaries in and everything up and everything so that you can operate from the Super Bowl site. That doesn't happen in a minute. That's hard to do. And then you think about the families. As George Young always told me, he said, hey, one thing I learned from the Super Bowls He said, and I learned it the hard way, he said, was make sure that Super Bowl week, that the families, they're going to be there. Make sure that there are no distractions. They're happy with their tickets, number one, because they talk, they compare. If one team gives their players really good seats and one team gives their players really bad seats, And I know of a case, I'm not going to tell you what game it was, but I know of a case where there was almost a crisis because of this. Because the wives were so upset where they were sitting compared to where the other team's wives were sitting. One team got rid of all their good seats and put their players and the families' tickets in the upper deck. And that is something you don't want to deal with. You want to make sure they have plans so that they're not driving the players crazy and that the players can concentrate on what they need to concentrate on. There's so much other stuff that goes into that game. As far as getting ready with the X's and O's, they're ready when they, when they touch down in the Super Bowl city on a Monday or a Sunday night or a Monday night, whenever they come in, they're ready to play. They've already done the game plan. I mean, they've done the game plan right away. They've installed everything. They get a little extra time to work on situations. They get a little time to work on things they don't usually. So they can work on two-point plays. They can work on late game stuff. They can work on goal line stuff. They can work on special team stuff, stuff they don't get a chance to work on during the regular season. Yeah, they can self-scout themselves. They do a lot of things that they don't do in a regular week. But as far as them being ready to play from the standpoint of X's and O's, they're ready to play right away. They, they could play that Sunday easy. And it's, they've done it. And it's actually sometimes produced better games. But the other stuff that surrounds this game, and this year, there is going to be more of a chance for distractions than normal years because everybody – now, I'm not sure exactly where the teams are staying – I didn't check to see where the teams were staying in Vegas. But that is, could be a recipe for disaster what could go on in that town. I mean, there are times where you usually have a couple of players who you want to make sure 
behave on Super Bowl week. Everybody's got a couple of guys they at least want to make sure they know where they are on Super Bowl week. In that town where, you know, everything is everywhere, it is a much bigger problem than it ever is in any of these cities. I mean, the other towns in America are ghost towns compared to this one. So that is going to be very interesting. And it will be fascinating to see exactly how teams treat that, knowing that there is such a recipe for temptation. Players who are coming in to have fun, who aren't playing, they can do whatever they want, and they will. You're talking about your team here, and you're talking about, hey, I mean, there are guys who coaches worry about during the week. And they know who they are, and they know how to take care of it. I mean, you know, try and get up on a team's floor in a hotel during the week. I mean, it's like Fort Knox. And for a very good reason. And you want your team to be loose. You want them to enjoy the idea of being in that game, but you also want them to stay to business. And I've seen teams be overly tight, and I've seen teams just, you know, just not be ready to play that game, especially if you're there for the first time. It helps if you've been there before without any question. And everybody but Detroit here, Harbaugh has obviously been there now as team hasn't, but most of those guys are gone. So uh, San Francisco has been there. Kansas City has lived there. And Baltimore, at least the coaching staff, knows something about it, and they've been there. So you only have Detroit to deal with, and they would be on such a high and would be so much the darlings of the Super Bowl if they got there. Because, you know, there's a real feeling in the NFL now of, hey, you know what? I got to be happy for Detroit. And you're hearing that everywhere. You know, like when they celebrated the other day, I was rooting for Mayfield and and the Bucs. I picked the Bucs. So I was rooting for them. But when Detroit was celebrating at the end, you had to feel good for those fans. They have been through so much. And now they've had back-to-back playoff games at home and two victories. And this would be it. I mean, they have, you know, to get to a Super Bowl, you've always thought of two teams, at least I have, Detroit and Cleveland. You want to see them get their fan base to a Super Bowl. You can imagine the Lion fans, but... I can even imagine more the Brown fans. Because the Browns fans are unbelievable fans. And if they finally, you know, they've had their heart broken so many times. Now, remember, Cleveland, if you're old enough, back in the day was a great team. So were the Lions if you go back, old, you know, long enough. If you go back into the 50s. But that's now 70 years ago. Almost 70 years ago. So it's not yesterday. Even for Cleveland, when you think about, you know, their great teams of the 60s, with Ryan and Collins and Jim Brown and, you know, those teams, that's 1964. And obviously the earlier days in Cleveland where they had unbridled success. But that's the franchises you think about, Cleveland and Detroit. And now here is Detroit on the doorstep. It would be hard as a, someone who's been around in the game as long as I have and followed it and been part of the NFL for so many years, over 40 years. And if they were winning late, and I have no dog in that fight as to who, I, you know, who wins the game. You know, I root for whoever I pick. But the bottom line is um, if they're winning that game late, you got to feel good for them. You really do. Because it's been a long, long time coming. 
And that would really be something. They would go there, and their feet wouldn't touch the ground. I would worry about them in the game because they would be so elated having just gotten there and would be such heroes for getting there. Uh, I'd be worried about them in the game. I really would. Because that's how much the sense of accomplishment for them would be if they got there. Now, their coach knows what he's doing. And I'm sure he could bring them down to earth, but he'd have a lot of work to do to bring them back down to earth. Their feet wouldn't touch the ground the first week. They'd be Wednesday of of the game week before their feet ever touched the ground. That's how great a win would be for Detroit to finally, finally get that franchise into a Super Bowl. And that would be extra work there because you look for those little things like that. You know, it's a little of the... Sense or the touch you try to bring to a bowl game is the motivation and who's equipped to play in it. That would be very hard for Detroit. It really would. But again, we're a long way from that. So we should have an absolute classic in the first game. I mean, I expect that game to be played on such a high level. The quarterback matchup is fascinating. We all know what this game would mean to Jackson, who is going to be the MVP, who now got, you know, everybody off his back with that performance last week. He could finally take a deep breath. You could tell when he came out in the third quarter and that game was 10-10, you could tell on the first drive how much he was worried about where that game was. You could see it in his demeanor. Because he's usually not that way, but you could see it in his demeanor that day. It was such a sense of relief for him later in that half when he stormed into the end zone. You could tell what a sense of relief it was that he had finally taken his team to the championship game, but also gotten people to leave him alone about how he played in these games. On the other side, he's got the guy. The guy who is, you know, a Super Bowl went away from being a living legend. He is one more Super Bowl away from just that, being an immortal player while he's still playing. That's how big Mahomes will be. He has been incomparable in these spots. His record as an underdog is unbelievable. And he he did his job He did everything right last week, made no mistakes. In a year where he's had plenty of mistakes, and both those quarterbacks made very few mistakes. Now, a lot of people are on on Josh for not hitting digs underneath on the third down pass where he tried to get Shakur coming across the end zone. Now, Shakur was open. He was wide open. He just underthrew him. He had the play there, and everyone's going crazy about him not taking digs underneath. I was surprised the way they played those two downs. I thought with the time they had and where they were, time, timeouts, everything, I thought they would set up a chip shot field goal with very little time on the clock rather than attack from the 26 into the end zone, knowing they'd be leaving quite a time on the clock anyway. I was very surprised that they didn't have a run set up that gave Josh a chance either drive him deep and then let Josh run or set up an organized run for him right off the bat and let him see if he can break the ball, you know, down to the 10-yard line, where if they had gotten the ball down to around the 10, they could have managed the clock perfectly. And if they had a field goal, it would have been a chip shot. This was not a chip shot field goal. I, don't, I know he had the wind at his back. I know it was 44 yards. I know the distance wasn't going to be an issue, but sometimes that wind can push the ball, and it clearly did. It wasn't a good kick. You have to use the wind in those spots. You can't miss that field goal. That's all there is to it. But... When they're sitting there on third down and they're on the 26-yard line 
on second down and third down. Second down was the play to digs. The third down was the run right. And then obviously the fourth down is the kick. But the second down play, people got crazy that he didn't hit digs underneath. He was wide open. But so was the receiver in the end zone. He had come clear. The ball just was on the throne. The, I was surprised, though, that they didn't utilize their game more and the clock more and try to run the ball on second down and let Josh try to break a play, which he's so proficient at doing, and get that thing down to where they could manage the game, take a couple of shots at the end zone, and then have a chip shot. I was surprised. Hey, if they had hit a touchdown there and won the game, no one would have said a word. The results make people come back and want to replay everything. If he had hit secure for a touchdown right there, and then their defense held, no one would have said a word. But leaving him any amount of time, and knowing that even if that field goal is good, you left him plenty of time to come down the field and win. And you know him, he probably would have done it. So I was surprised by that. But not so much with the fact that he went for it on second. I mean, that's, that's who he is. But agreed, I, I, I was surprised they played it that way. It didn't work out. And the kick didn't work out. And obviously, they have a second field goal now to talk about for a while. They've talked about the other one. Maybe that gets Norwood a little bit off the hook, although that one was obviously for the whole thing. I'll never forget lining up for that Super Bowl and that building. Still the best game, NFL game I've ever been to. And as good an NFL game as I've seen because, you know, there were no turnovers in that game. The game was played in such an incredible atmosphere with the Gulf War, the Whitney Houston National Anthem, everything, the patriotism, everything that went on there. That game was unbelievable. And that, as the game wore on, and now they're lining up for that kick. And you're thinking, oh. And you watch that kick sail right, and the just crushing blow that was to those fans. And then the elation from the, you know, giant fans who were in the building. There were so many in the building. And remember, that Buffalo team that year, that Buffalo team was an incredibly dominant team. They beat the Raiders 51-3 to in the AFC title game. And they were almost considered unbeatable. The Giants, were, Giants beat the Niners in the three-peat game and were still a seven-point underdog in the Super Bowl. I have to tell you, the day before the game, I was sitting with Bill and Ron Earhart on Saturday morning in his office, and they were incredibly confident that they were going to win the game. I mean, really. And the only time, it's funny with Bill, you never saw him ever at ease in a game. Unless they were an underdog, he seemed to be more at ease in that role than he was when they were a heavy favorite. You never saw him as confident. In this game, he was incredibly confident that they were going to win. And he really felt that they were going to run the ball right down their throat, which they did, and kept it for 40 minutes. That was the best defense. The best defense wasn't the defense that has been lauded forever. Yes, it was an interesting defense. It's a concept that has gotten an enormous amount of attention. Uh, it really was a big feather in Belichick's cap and everything else, but the, not, the Bills scored 19 points in 19 minutes with the ball. They scored a point a minute. They challenged them to run the ball. They wanted to take away the passing game. They did that. They made sure they crunched any receiver that caught the ball coming across the middle. They didn't want to come across very often. They got hit really hard early in the game. And the physical nature of the Giants was an enormous factor in that game, both in their line play and just the way they hit throughout the game. And, you know, they had those two incredible drives 
and Hostetler held on to the ball. You know, what a run Hostetler had that year. And he held on to the ball when he got hit in the end zone where it was a safety, but he should have given up the ball for a touchdown easy. And that they would have been down. Instead of being down 12-3, they would have been down 17-3. And at 12-3, I remember that drive right before the half and touchdown Baker in the corner, make it 12-10. And at halftime, the fans were, Giant fans were very confident. Because we, they were, we were underneath, just walking around, waiting for the second half to start. And I'm telling you, I must have talked to a gazillion Giant fans, and they were all very confident because of that drive. And they came out with a great drive in the third quarter and took the lead. And we know what a classic game it was. But that Bills team, people forget, was an incredible team. And we know the heartache that came with the next three Super Bowls. The one they should have won, though, was the first. We know that. But they didn't. And that's what makes it unbelievable. That's what makes it such a special day. And it's such, you know, a game that you remember forever that can go either way. Which is what you get a lot of times in these championship games, and I think you could get that again with Kansas City and Baltimore. I think that game will be played on an incredible level, and I think it will be a very close game. Nobody's going to knock, knock out Kansas City. Their defense is a lot better than people think. And they got a lot of youngsters really stepping up. And Spags has done a great job with that defense. And that defense has really played well all year. And it makes it a great game. Fascinating game on every level. We'll do the podcast Friday with the championship games and the picks and everything else. We'll see you then. Thanks for listening to the Mike Francesa podcast on the Bet Rivers Network.